This episode's brought to you by Squarespace, but more on them later. Today, in order to get Brewpeg into the water, we need to upgrade our sandblaster so we're ready to go when we get into the paint bay. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you'll know that we do our own sandblasting. And we've had a bit of a journey figuring out how to make a sandblaster work. We've gone from, in the early days, just buying a dry sandblaster and trying to get it to work, um, through to building a pressurized system that uses a high pressure water blaster as well as a three phase air compressor here. Um, it's a bit of a fire breather, but we need to increase its capacity because we've got a lot of boat to start sandblasting. And at the moment, we've got a bit of a maths challenge. Let me walk you through the issue. If you're looking for a sandblaster, you've got a few options. We bought this off eBay. It was the cheapest sandblaster that we could find. I think we paid $110 for it. It's a 10 gallon tank and it comes as a dry blaster. Um, over the years, we've given this thing a lot of work. Um, we've probably put maybe five, six ton of sand through this thing over the years, over the last six years of using it. So it's had a really hard life, and as a result, we've got a pretty good understanding of what works and what doesn't on these things. As um, a 10 gallon tank, you get about 15 minutes worth of blasting out of this if you're blasting at 110 PSI. When you go to fill it up, they come with a small fill up port. So it's about an inch and a half diameter fill port, and you get one of these funnels. So quite constricted down the bottom. It's only probably three quarters of an inch across the bottom, 20 mil, something like that. When you stick that in and you start filling it up, it takes about 15 minutes to fill it up. So for every 15 minutes of blasting, you've got 15 minutes of filling. The easiest thing and the, probably one of the most effective things that we did was actually cut that, that inch and a half diameter lid off and we welded on a four inch diameter lid. We made a little spanner so that we can hook onto it and undo it that transformed our blasting. We still get 15 minutes of blasting, but it takes us about 20 to 30 seconds to fill the tank again. So it's much, much faster now, and we can cover you know, a lot more area in the same amount of time. The next thing that wears out on them is the ball valves. Because you've got sand going through this system, the ball valves don't last. If you're using this constantly, you'll probably get a month to three months out of the ball valves. If you use it periodically, you might get a year out of them. Um, but what we found is um, make the ball valves so that you can rip them off really fast and just replace them. And we just put lots of uh, cheap replacements in so that we don't have to worry about wearing out expensive parts. Let me show you what we did. This is the mixing chamber where you've got high pressure air coming in down in this line and you've got the sand coming through this line here. And they mix in this chamber here and then get fired out down this line here going out to the, to the gun. We've modified this quite a bit. So um, this is standard. This is what you get in the cheapest chips blasters. But we've welded on, we cut the end of this chamber off and we welded on a big fitting, a stainless fitting so that we can screw in hose tails. The reason I did that is because this part wears out. So if you don't change it, you end up basically having holes blast through the steel. Eventually it starts wearing out and you end up with this part failing. I don't know if you can buy this part as a replacement, but if you do this, you don't need to. This is the only part that wears out on them. And we've, as I say, we've been blasting for many years now with this. And we've never had a problem with anything in this side of the chamber. It's always been on this side of the chamber. The next thing that fails is these ball valves. So you're normally actually running with the ball valve half open. So you don't want to have it full bore, but you do need the control of being able to have a ball valve. Now these are not designed for throttling. So they actually start chewing out the stainless, they chew out the Teflon seals. These don't last very long. You get about three months out of these, but we order them off eBay and, and you know again, we use really cheap ball valves because we know that they're not gonna last. Nothing fails on them except for the Teflon wearing out. And it doesn't matter what you spend on a ball valve, the Teflon is still the weakest link. So that's the next thing we do is cheap ball valves. The next problem you'll have with these is if you don't filter your garnet well enough, or you've got garnet that has you know lumps and bumps in it that are a bit bigger than normal, they get stuck and they jam up in this part, this throat up in here. The trouble with that is, in order to clear that, you have to pull this whole assembly off the red tank, poke something in, vacuum it out, tip all the sand out, whatever it is that's needed to do to clear that, that sort of obstruction out and then put the whole thing back together. So it's not a very user-friendly mechanism so if you're building your own you want to probably have a, a port in here that you can undo and then poke a screwdriver up or do something so that you can clear that out without having to disassemble this whole mechanism so that's the kind of the downsides of running these machines but in saying all of that they're very effective they're very cheap and they work they're a lot slower than a commercial unit but they're so cheap to run um, we did some calculations when we make our own sand it costs us around three dollars and twelve cents for a square meter of metal blasted down to white metal the next upgrade you'll want to do is increasing the diameter of this pipe to start with they're about a 13 millimeter or half inch diameter pipe 
and you can use garden hose on this, it does last. Um, you don't have huge velocity sand coming down here, but if you increase the diameter, it slows it down and it doesn't wear this pipe out so much. They'll normally blow holes in the pipe in the first six inches of this, and you can just snip that off and then re, you know, refit it back up onto the, onto the hose tail. So expect to go through this pipe, but we just used to use garden hose and that allowed us to have a 15 meter sand delivery pipe and it, was, it worked perfectly well. It wore out, but so did everything else that we tried to fit onto there. The next thing we did was upgrade our gun. This is our short stubby gun. This gun here is available for sale in Australia at a company called Able Sales. This, there's a link in the description to get this exact nozzle. The reason we like this nozzle is because it's so rebuildable. It's very heavy duty for what it is. Um, we've mod obviously modified this and we've shortened that right up so that we have a very stubby um, you know, gun to, to nozzle ratio. Normally this is a pressure washer setup, so the high pressure water comes in this end here. You've got your normal trigger for the pressure washer, and then we've just got a ball valve that's either fully open or fully closed for the sand delivery. And that essentially fires pressurised sand in here, pressurised water down there. They combine in this chamber and then get fired out this nylon nozzle. Now this is a nylon nozzle with a ceramic insert. You need to have a ceramic insert or you'll just tear apart your nozzle. If you've got a ceramic insert, you'll get years out of them. Um, if you don't have it, you'll get minutes. Because we're going to be launching Brewpeg soon, we need to make this sandblaster much more effective than what it is. And it's not because it won't do the job in its current state, it will, it works fine. The issue that we have is it costs an extraordinary amount of money to put Brewpeg into the sandblasting bays. So we need to be in and out as fast as we can. And that's what we're doing today's upgrade. So by increasing the throat size of the sandblaster, we were able to massively increase our throughput in terms of blasting and areas covered and that sort of thing. But one of the challenges that we have is because we need to manage the cost, it's three times the price in the blast bays than what it is having the boat sitting here. So for us, that's something we have to manage. And that means being faster and more effective at our jobs. So that means that the 10 gallon tank that we have on that red sandblaster is just not big enough. Every 15 minutes, we have to stop and refill and then start again. We're up on six meter high scaffolds when we're blasting this boat, so it's a bit of a mission getting up and down all the time so one of the most effective things that we can do is increase the tank size this is a lpg tank that we found at the scrapyard it's been decommissioned because it's obviously over its age limit but this is a perfect pressure vessel for us to use as a sandblaster when you grab a tank like this from the scrapyard they've normally had a pretty hard life you can see this is bashed around and marked there's a big dent in the side that won't affect its operation in any way but one thing you will notice is there's a hole here and they always punch a hole in it to make them useless as a pressure vessel. However, we can weld that up, but we're not going to weld that up because I need a pressure relief valve. I'll show you what that does. This little fitting here is a pressure relief valve and you can pull it and it relieves the pressure out of the cylinder or it'll actually just do it on its own. So if you get, let's say that this is set for 110 PSI, if you get to 110 PSI, this here will automatically lift up like that and start dispatching air out of the little valves around the side here. And what that does is it keeps it safe. So if this keeps pressurizing, eventually it'll explode. Um, if it has a pressure relief valve, then you're safe. You can always know that it's gonna be no more than a certain amount of pressure. So we're gonna use this pressure relief valve and we're gonna put it into our big tank. When you're gonna start cutting into a tank that used to hold flammable liquid or flammable gas, you need to do a few things so that you don't explode and die. Easiest way to get rid of the danger is to remove the gas and to remove any of the combustibility. I actually just put some straight water in Leave that for a while. You can smell the gas coming out of it so that you know you know that there's you know definitely residue and things like that. But by filling it up with water, you pretty much remove any ability for it to combust on its own. We are going to be plasmering, so we will be you know firing rubbish into this tank, you know, liquid metal and things like that, definitely enough to set it off and combust it. But by filling it up with water, we can leave the water pretty high. So most of this tank will be filled with water when we're doing this. We'll plasma in, you'll hear the water popping and bubbling and things like that, but there's no risk of explosion when you do it that way. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to build a stunning website and run your own business how you want. We love anything that makes it possible to create a business or a website on your own terms, and these guys offer this. Squarespace provides mobile optimized websites, and we love the website layout options. For a channel, it's all about how to get great shots, and Squarespace helps you figure this out. The cool thing is that they can help secure a website domain name and a link to the website that you've just built on their platform. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, head to squarespace.com forward slash project brewpeg to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Right, time to remove some bits.
Right, that part won't be used anymore. Turns out there was a bit of sand in there. Well, I guess I've committed myself now that I've completely destroyed the old one. New parts. This is a four inch threaded internal thread. There we go. You can see that, just black steel, nothing fancy, no stainless. That's just a piece of, um, just a bung that goes in the, in the top. They're a tapered fit. They're a lovely, lovely fit, there you go. Um, they're just galvanized. Well, this one's galvanized, this one's just black steel. That's what we've used in the past. They work really, really well. They seal air well if you tighten them. You don't have to go crazy to tighten them. They, they seal up pretty good. What I am gonna do is try and retain this big ring. The reason being is because we made our custom little funnel thing here. So it's basically one of the normal funnels you get and we chop the bottom off so you get a big opening. It fits perfectly in this. So I wanna retain this ring if I can because one of the challenges, even though this is quite a big diameter, is that um, funnel does sort of sometimes fall off. So by having this ring on there, hopefully we've got something to hold it. So, let's get that about centered. I'll use that to make sure she's good. Mark out where that has to be cut. Sunny's down, so you look cool doing it. pressure relief valve. I just want to cut all of the manky weld off so that I can get a nice clean circle to weld into the tank. Okay, now we've got the edge of that weld cleaned up. Just want to mark it in where that's actually going to go. Let's chuck it in there. Yep, that'll weld in perfect. Now that we've got the top components welded into the tank, it's time to start looking at this contraption. What this is, this is the old lid. So this is what we're building basically, one of these. Now we need this pipe. This is an air delivery pipe. So the way that it works, you've got your compressor feed here. You've got a ball valve here to turn your compressor on and off. It goes into this chamber, which allows air to go two directions. One up this tube here and the other down this here. So this is a ball valve, just a little 3.8 ball valve, upside down at the moment, but that there comes down and feeds air into this mixing chamber. So you've got your sand at the bottom of the tank comes through this ball valve, and you've got air coming through here and into this chamber here. And the sand and the air mix, and then get fired down the line all the way down to the gun sitting over there. So this is the part that we need to build. This is sitting at the top of the tank. So what I'm gonna do is just slice that, and then weld that pipe directly onto our chamber up the top here. I need to drill a hole in the side, but it'll stick out the back of the tank like so. Now that the top's welded up, we've got the pressure relief and I've fitted it back in. I've also screwed the lid back into the big valve here. What I'm going to do is flip it upright because I have to weld on the bottom, but also it's going to tell me if any of these are leaking. So um, full of water, when I flip it upright, I'm going to have maybe one, one and a half PSI of pressure, something like that, enough to get some leak testing going on. It's pretty heavy when it's full. So, right, we will get it up. Famous last words. Okay. Right, the lid's leaking, but that's okay. What we need to know is if any of the welds themselves are leaking, you'll see the water run down. Doesn't matter that the lid thread is leaking, that's almost irrelevant. No, we're good. There's no leaks anywhere, so I'm looking all around this thing here. And all around here, can't see leaks anywhere. It's all coming from the thread, which is a good sign. Cool, we'll press on. This is the bottom of the tank. 
the fitting that you have at the bottom, you want to be mounted as low as you possibly can because you want all of the sand, or as much as the sand as possible, to run down into that fitting. So you don't want to punch a hole through it and then weld a fitting in and have like a big lip that the sand has to come down and go up and over because you end up with a you know, couple of litres of sand at the bottom that you physically can't use. Unless you shake your machine every two or three seconds, it won't get into that pipe. So drill your hole, blast the hole, etc. But don't cut it so big that your fitting goes through. Cut it so your fitting sits on top. So no matter what, the tank is, is basically a smooth run all the way into that hole. This is the fitting out of the old red tank. So I've just ground the edges up. It's quite thick, and that's exactly the way that they did it, is welding it onto the bottom of the tank. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'll punch a hole in here that might be, say, half inch round. It um, doesn't have to be. A, this, this here is probably, I don't know, 40 millimetres or, say, an inch and a half diameter. I'm going to punch maybe a half inch hole line it up, bang up over the top of it, and then just weld all the way around so that this is a nice thick piece of steel to screw into, but at the same time, it's not going to protrude into the tank at all. With the new fittings in the bottom, it's going to stick out about sort of four or five inches. So we obviously need to raise this, do some legs, that sort of thing, so that it doesn't, you know, sit on the parts. So what I'm going to do is actually strap this onto the side like so, weld that on, and then that's going to form one leg, and then I can just do a single leg on just a single piece of pipe on the other side, and that'll be enough to hold this thing upright in the height that it needs to be. Now that we've got some big custom stainless legs, it's time to start focusing on the mechanics. This is the mixing chamber for the sand. I need to uh, allow room for the pipe that comes out this end. If you have a look here, you can see that there's a thread just up in there, but this part here gets in the way. So the pipe that goes into that thread basically bumps into this part here. So I'm gonna get rid of this. Now that I've cut that out of the way, the pipe's got a nice smooth path. You can see why I had to get rid of it. It was going to hit basically everywhere that had steel before. Now there's a nice smooth path with no sharp edges. This is quite funny. I just flipped it over and talking about ball valves wearing out, that ball valve there is fully closed <laughs> and that's the water just dribbling out of it. And that's because the Teflon in this ball valve is starting to get shot. So um, they don't last long. This one's probably halfway through its life. It's maybe got one more go out of it, proper go out of it and then we'll have to throw that ball valve away. The final job before we can start hooking these pipes up and actually use this tank is hooking up this air gauge, the compressor ball valve, as well as the air feed ball valve, the little mixing chamber, it's all sort of one unit. What we need to do is basically pressurize this tank. Normally they feed it into this, um, basically the filling nozzle. It doesn't really matter, it doesn't have to go into the filling nozzle, it's just a convenient place to put it. I'm actually gonna put it on the side of the tank, so I'm gonna blow a hole in the side and just punch it straight in. It will be mounted around the back of the tank so that it lines up with the, the pipe that has to run down the tank and connect up to that bottom mixing chamber, but it's a simple location to put it in. One thing we have found that works really well for air hose is um, fuel pipe. It's reinforced and it's able to take a decent amount of pressure. But it's pretty tight, so you need to put some hot water over the end of it to loosen it up in order to get over most of your hose tails. Sometimes these fittings can be a bit of a mission to get on. Fuel pipe is pretty tight, it's what we're using for air hose. It's 9.5mm and, and this is not a 9.5mm fitting, so I think that's 3.8 from memory. And this is slightly bigger, this might be like a 10mm fitting or something like that, but basically it's causing a bit of challenge to get this on. So I actually use a bit of rubber grease to help and then you can get it to, the trouble is if, if it pinches, it pinches up on the inside of the pipe. It makes it a real challenge. I think it's pinched up already. Yeah, it just won't completely go on. And if you, and you probably can't see it, but if you look down the pipe, you can see that there's a, like a ridge, and that's essentially the rubber getting pushed back up from this very front edge here. 
made a couple of changes. Right on this very edge, I just um, chucked it on the bench grinder and radiused off that edge so that there's no sharp bit to catch on the pipe. This is going to be a problem every time we take this pipe on and off, so I thought I'll fix the actual hose tail rather than try and butcher the, the uh, pipe on. Oh, look at the difference. There's no rubber lube on this at the moment. One-handed. Yoink! And then we use a thread sealant. In this case, it's just a, it's a Loctite 577, but it doesn't have to be Loctite. That's just the brand that was at the shop that we need to go to. Gauges fit back on, pipe back in. She's good to go. Oh, by the way, Jess gave me a hand to put some paint on it too, just so that we can protect it from the elements. All right, that elements malarkey is not quite true. We actually need the help, so we built a minion. We added a few things the other blaster didn't have. So we've got our four inch opening so that we can do fast refills. We've got the same blasting mechanism down the bottom there so that everything is, is pretty much standard. There's no changes there. We chucked a couple of stainless fittings on the side so that we can coil up our pipes. That was always a challenge with the other one. They dangled everywhere. And then also made a little fitting up here to house our spanner to undo the lid. The lid itself has this spanner. We put a bend in it so that it'll fit inside that, that sort of rim. But also the bend fits nicely when you tuck that on the side. So it's a decent little spanner storage rack now. Bonus information time, I'm gonna show you the full process that we use to get sandblasting quality garnet so that we can get our steel down to white metal. As part of doing our own DIY blasting, we had to figure out a way of doing our own sand. Garnet for sandblasting is about $750 per tonne, so it's pretty expensive where we are. You can buy it in little bags, but it actually works out to be more per tonne in the small bags. It's, although in saying that, they are great for doing little odds and sobs jobs. If you're not gonna be doing a lot of sandblasting, the bags are really good. However, we do bucket loads of sandblasting, so we needed to make our own and it needed to be cheap. This is sandblasting garnet. So it's made from rock and crushed down. It's incredibly hard, it's also very sharp. They have a tolerance level, so they'll have each one of these grains will be plus or minus a certain size, and you can order what grain size you need. This stuff is awesome for blasting. It's really, really effective. However, it's very expensive, and that's why we use silica-free river sand. Something to factor in when you are doing your own sandblasting is silica um, poisoning. It's basically a condition that, is, uh, from what I understand, makes it very difficult to breathe. It affects your lungs and so on. It's pretty nasty stuff. Um, when you're sandblasting, you have to have decent protective gear. If you're dry sandblasting, you want to have really good respirator and so on, not like just a little dust mask. You need a proper gas mask that can filter as much as possible out. We wet blast, which takes about 95% of the actual dust away from the, the whole scheme of things. Um, the other side that we do to try and protect ourselves from silica is we actually use um, river sand. So it's sand that's been created in a river as opposed to like a beach. Um, the silica is actually washed out of it. So we know that it's silica free because it has to be tested. In Australia, you can't sell silica sand uh, for use in like uh, school playgrounds and stuff like that. The sand on the bottom has to be silica free. So we actually use that sand and then filter it down so that we can blast knowing that we have silica free um, media that we're using. For us, it starts off by getting a load of sand from our garden shop supplier. They dump it into our truck. We then bring it back and shovel it into our trailer. You can see there's some big lumps in there. That's gonna to be too big for our sandblaster to handle. So I'll show you how we get that down to the right size. We have quite a few sheets of old plywood, thin plywood, three millimeter, four millimeter, something like that, that we actually lay the sand out on, and this is to dry it. So once it's been here for maybe an hour, two hours in the Australian sun, it's nice and dry. We can then start picking it up and putting it into a bucket. Once we've collected our sand, you can see it's dry, but it still has the big particles in it that have to be removed. So we built a sand sieve. We started off in the early days hand sieving everything. So we'd literally have the kitchen sieves that we were actually sieving the sand through by hand. It took a long time to get every one of those black 60 litre buckets. And then we started to mechanicalize it. We had a few goes at it. We went from electric to petrol. This was when we decided let's strap a lawnmower to the side of our sand juggler. And it vastly improved what we could do but then flew apart. So we tried another version of petrol. We got a two stroke engine, strapped it on. It was way too powerful and it just blew everything apart. And then we revised our plans and came up with rolling thunder. The design that we've used for the last three or four years that worked an absolute treat is this. It's a standard old cement mixer. Cheapest chips, it was $180 I think, brand new off eBay, but you know, it's the cheapest you could get. We cut these great big holes in it and added mesh to it. So we started welding, but it didn't work. We ended up just using um, a adhesive and sealing it on and it goes all the way around. So there's four of these big holes right the way, you know, diameter wise, right the way around this thing. We then put a little tin um, catch thing at the bottom of it and it dumps fi sieved filtered sand down into this part, which we can then use, store, do whatever we need to. And at the end, you're left with this. This is the waste product. It's basically all of the rocks 
and everything that has to come out. If any of these go through the sandblaster, they'll jam it up. So as soon as you get a jam in the sandblaster, it's it's a 20 minute process to pull the whole thing apart, empty the sand, resieve the sand, it's a, it's a big deal. So we have to get rid of all of these. And you can sort of see there's a lot of rubbish that comes through the sand. This is normal, you get, absolutely get this every time you do the, you know, get a load of sand. Um, and for it, we lose about maybe 15% of the total sand we buy to, to rocks and stones and things, but we have to take them out. When we take them out, we're left with this beautiful, clean, sieved sand. So there's quite small particles, like almost dust, and there's some um, you know, reasonable sized particles in here, but all of these particles will fit through the machine itself. So none of them are big enough to jam up and stop the machine from working. So this is our blasting garnet that we use. So let's talk for a sec about the different types of blasting there are. You've got wet blasting, what we do, and you've got dry blasting. Dry blasting is sort of traditionally what most people think of when you think of sand blasting. Dry blasting is where you have a big compressor with an air reservoir strapped to a separate sand reservoir. It's a lot of equipment, does an amazing job, excellent at what it's actually built for, but it is costly. Dry blasting has its place. We've had brew peg dry blasted in multiple locations inside tanks. We had the hull dry blasted. It's really fast. So those guys can rip uh, 12 square meters of steel down to white metal in one hour. So it's an incredibly fast way of blasting. There's no way that we could be that fast. Our machine's just not powerful enough. However, our machine has advantages that no other type of blasting can do. When you're inside a small confined space, like a tank in this case, Dry blasting is almost impossible to see what you're doing. So you end up blasting for 20 seconds, stopping, clearing your visor, trying to see, you know, have you blasted at all, and then carrying on again. It's very stop start, stop start, and it's quite slow. When you've got a wet blaster like this, you can just blast away because the water takes almost all of the dust away, and you're left with a little bit of steam around you, etc., a little bit of water mist, but it's still very easy to see what you're doing compared to dry blasting. Dry blasting also leaves a slight residue of dust on the material. It sometimes embeds it into the steel, and that can be a challenge. You have to clean it really well to get that off. You can often blow it off with air and then also solvents to, to wipe it clean, but because you've roughed the surface up with the sand blasting, it's difficult to wipe a rag over it without leaving residue from the rag. Wet blasting, on the other hand, cleans the material as you blast. So you can see here, as I'm blasting the paint away, the material itself is in really good, clean condition. Now, it will rust, but that's not actually a problem. Once we blast, we allow the steel to rust and get a very slight sheen of rust going on. That allows us to put a phosphoric acid-based rust converter on. Now, this chemically etches into the steel, and it allows you to then put your paint, whether it be single pack or two pack, over top of that, and it'll get a really good chemical bond into the substrate below. A lot of people think rust is a bad thing under paint. It is, if you don't prepare it right. If you use a phosphoric acid, it's actually part of the preparation. So that's our process. From collecting the sand through to drying it and sieving it, putting it into our IBCs for storage, into our home-built wet hydro blaster, and then we can start using our modified nozzle so that we can blast steel down to white metal.